find a way to channel your anger in a way that is productive and useful and helpful for you and your community. And only you know that. You talk about, you know, a lot about recognizing institutional barriers, you know, that are put in place, you know, throughout the country within black communities that, you know, prevent, uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, advancement. What would you say to somebody, um, maybe particular, uh, like, uh, you know, we have, we have fans who might not be familiar with uh, that concept. What would you say to people who uh, don't, understand what an institutional barrier is what, what are some... so i think what i would ask them i think the first piece would be if they've ever had an experience where a part of their identity or something they want to engage in was not considered permissible not considered cool not considered acceptable right so i think starting there on that base level because many of us have had that experience regardless of our racial background right so then I want somebody to kind of imagine that that small piece of their experience, maybe it was that they were the skater kid in the neighborhood, but that wasn't cool, right? You know, maybe that, maybe they were, you know, into um, rock and roll or, or electric guitars when it wasn't cool to be into electric guitars. So just imagine that particular kind of um, backlash you get on a social level being something that's actually built in to the media, to institutions, and something that has historically been legislated and put into law, that it was unacceptable for you to actually embrace that and that you would be penalized and harmed for actually liking that particular thing, like and through violence, through targeted, targeted by the state, targeted by institutions. Just imagine that prejudice or that experience you have on a much broader level with the historic legacy behind it. And I think that's one way to get people to begin to thinking about like, huh, what would that feel like? What would that look like? And even if you don't know what that would feel and look like, it gives people a sense of like, when we talk about structural racism, or structural misogyny, or structural transphobia, those are the things we're talking about. Like it's been legislated and built into the world that a certain facet of your existence or your being is not um, valuable, desired, or worthy. Nice, nice. And on that note, you know, your organization, being the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, you know, you guys do work to knock down those barriers, um, you know, every day, no matter where they pop up. You know, what are some ways that you guys are doing that, you know, in, a, in the efforts to, ex to continue to explain what are institutional barriers? You know, what are you, what are you Absolutely. Doing? Absolutely. So on multiple levels, we organize, right? So one level, a large part of our work is really focused on the reality that the vast majority of people in Black communities, we get our mental health support, not necessarily from the psychiatric the psychiatrist, the therapist, we might go to the barbershop, we might go to our cousin, we might go to the coach, we might go to a teacher. Or like, and we recognize that those folks, if those folks have skills and strategies to be able to show up and offer support for folks in a more helpful and useful way, because sometimes we don't, right? Sometimes you go to the barber and he tell you something that's like, oh, that wasn't really helpful and I'm actually having a really hard time. Or really, maybe I'm really showing symptoms of something that's like mental health distress. But if, I go, but if I go to these people and they actually have skills and tools and strategies to actually support me, to get me into care if I need to get into care, who have skills to listen, who understand mental health and mental health stigma, then that becomes, cultivates a whole wraparound community of care, a whole crap wraparound community of wellness, as opposed to relying only on these select few professionals, right? And that begins to shift the system. In addition to that work on a policy level, um, being, we're really working with like legislators, working with also like, you know, um, community organizations to really transform the ways in which we even approach mental health, but also like why there isn't more support economically on a federal or state level for specifically black men, mental health funded and led organ program, right? That's not something we see a lot right now. Right now, um, as, a, as a person who runs a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to black mental health and healing, less than like 2% of funding in this country goes to mental health broadly, right? So we're not even talking about black mental health, right? We're talking about mental health, right? And so there needs to be like more funds allocated so they can be free and accessible. And we also have to do things like challenge insurance companies, right? Because right now, a lot of people can have health insurance, but guess what? You might have health insurance, but when you go to, when you go to, go to see a therapist, your copay is $150 a month, a, a session, excuse me. And like most people can't afford that for each session if you go on weekly. So one of the things we have to do is challenge the insurance companies to ask, why are you only reimbursing um, so little that a copay is so high, you know? So those are the policy shifts we need to see happen, right? And we also need to think about other policy shifts because like mental health isn't just clinical, right? It's also, it shows up in a lot of other ways. Schools, we go to our schools, they are prisons. 
they are set up like prison, right? That, that impacts my mental health. If I come in and I'm treated like a prison and actually channeled into the prison industrial complex. So how do we shift the way we even structure our schools and our institutions so they can actually promote my well-being, promote value and worthiness, as opposed to making me feel like I'm a criminal the minute I jump into school? Well, one thing that you mentioned um, on that note is, you know, that a lot of people go to the people around them who are just within their proximity for their therapy, whether it's venting to their friend or barber or teacher or coworker or whatever. Um, especially during this time when there's so much pressure and people are, are alone with their thoughts more, uh, what kind of strategies would you recommend for people, A, if they don't have the money for a therapist, like you said, and they have to go to the people around them, or B, um, if they're just wanting to, on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of collect themselves and calm themselves down a little bit? What kind of strategies can people implement on a day-to-day? -day? Absolutely, and this is a big part. I'm so glad you brought this into the room because this is a big part of the work that we do, right? So we recognize that most of us ain't got money for no therapist, talking to the people close to us, need some resources. So what we've been doing right now, and like I said, what we've, what we've done throughout the history of our organization, but during COVID-19, we've been really intentional with having these online, like peer support, like check-in spaces, meditation, all these pieces. Tonight, for example, at four, we have our Black Masculinity Reimagined program, right? And so Black Masculinity Reimagined, we've been doing this for years. It's really for Black men and masculine folks to have a space to talk about their mental health, but also see how their mental health impacts how they show up in the world, how that shows up in their relationships with women, with consent and sexuality, with their own kind of mental health in terms of able to, their ability to even do their work in the world, right? And so what we have tonight is actually a check-in space, all dedicated to Black masculinity, like, you know, really like for folks to check in and be like, this is what I'm struggling with and get support from myself and other peer counselors and, and therapists to be able to like support them and navigate that. And that's completely free. So we offer a lot of services like that. We also have meditation. We, all do, we, we just did a Reiki meditation for Black Lives. Sometimes we have um, other workshops focused on anxiety and they're free and people can call in and we also get them resources. So if people check out our website, beam.community, you go to our toolkits page, we have a lot of like um, writing prompts, like a lot of like educational graphics, we have videos you can watch, all these pieces because you're right. Most of us may not have anyone, but maybe we can go to Beam's website is our hope and find something that can be like, oh, that makes me think about something differently. That makes me, give me some hope or a different perspective on something. Because we have to create tools that go beyond just traditional, traditional therapy because it's not for everybody, right? It's not, everybody's not gonna go to that, you know? I'm interested in a word that you said a couple of clicks back, masculinity. You know, we are hip hop DX and, uh, Hip hop uh, culture is, you know, rooted in urban black communities. And, you know, the masculinity is basically uh, taught for you to be linear and hardened. So, you know, what kind of services do you guys offer when it comes to masculinity and benefit some of these uh, rappers that maybe don't know how to do yeah. I'm so glad you said. So I'm gonna share with you all, if you wanna share with this video, some really great graphics that kind of explain how we talk about masculinity. But I'm gonna give you an example that I often use about my godson, Dante, right? So young black boy, learning how to walk, right? Like a little baby. Learning how to walk, falls one day at the barbecue, starts crying, I pick him up and I call him like, okay, you all right, you all right, man, you're good. But just crying, right? Not hurt, but just crying, kind of shocked at like the whole thing. Father comes in the room, immediately comes to me and is like, put him down, he's gonna be a punk. You know, to put him down, you gotta teach him how to be a man, right? And so I'm just like, hold on, brother, you can't even poop on the toilet, much less like, well, why he gotta learn how to be a man? This is, maybe we're putting some things ahead of time, right? That is kind of definitive of a moment that happens for a lot of people who are men in this country is that we learn very early on to emotionally sever and cut off a part of ourselves, right? We are taught that like in order for us to be quote unquote men, that is what we need to do. And what the consequence of that is, is that we grow up into adults who become, have a limited emotional range, right? We can't really connect with our feelings and our emotions because that muscle hasn't been built and cultivated. We were taught we had to shut it down. So we end up doing a couple of things. We explode a lot because that's what we've been told. We're told it's okay to explode, to be enraged. We sometimes um, are using substances or other things to kind of like acclimate or kind of numb our pain. All we're suffering from depression and anxiety and all these other mental conditions because we've held all this stuff in for so long and it benefits racist systems because racism is like, oh, not only have we created this system where you don't have, a, uh, you don't have the skills and tools to process 
all you're experiencing from police brutality, from racism, from transphobia, you don't have the, pro you don't have the skills to process it. So now the only way you know how to process it is rage and violence. We got something for that. We got to, we going to channel you right in this, right, right into this tool, right into this place to make money for us and to exploit that and to, and, and to, and to, and to murder and to hurt that, right? And so it's not to, and it's, this is not um, blaming black men for the violence that is happening to them. It's naming how those, how the ways in which male socialization interact with white supremacy and racism, leading to um, many of us, many folks who are black men and masculine folks, just not being able to like navigate the systems because we don't have the, we don't have the emotional tools to even process all the pain we're experiencing. We don't have the, the, the capacity. And so a lot of our work is like working with us to say, hey, let's expand what it means to be masculine, what it means to be a black man. Let's, let's just assume that being a human, you know, I'm gonna say, fuck being a black man, a black woman, being a human, you are entitled to the full range of your emotions. There is a time for us to be strong, a time for us to be sad, a time for us to be weak. We have to own all that shit because racism says you don't get that black man because you're a brute, you're not human. So you don't get to have your full range of humans, your full range of, of emotions. We have to counter and push back on that. And so we create space for that. We create space for us to work through that, to be like, hey, it's hard to work this muscle because I've been taught, I'm scared to let this faucet turn on because I'm scared it's gonna overflow. But we gotta like start to build that muscle so we can show up as better partners, as better um, parents for our children who need different models than what we had. And so that's a large part of what we do with masculinity in our work. It's not saying we still can't be embraced the you know like the fun thing, other fun things about masculinity. It's saying that we also got more. It's not we're not limited. We got other pieces to us too. We're multidimensional. Well, I love well, the way you broke it down. Because, um, you know, just to touch on this real quick, Jeremy. Um, you know, hip hop does uh, promote a lot of negativity, you know, a lot of uh, toxic behavior. But, you know, from my viewpoint, I've never fully blamed hip hop because, you know, it starts in all the issues, all the system, uh, <clears throat> I mean, all the racist and uh, impoverished um, situations that make hip hop, you know, as authentic and raw as what it is, you know, so um yeah like you said if if you can't blame them necessarily for acting out like that but you know you guys are working on you know chipping chipping that away and you're also doing what we know right so i think about it for like my father my uncles and stuff they practice what was taught to them right and what was taught to them to us as survival strategies to navigate being black men masculine people in the world right and some of that stuff was good and useful and great, and some of that isn't good. Some of that wasn't great. Some of that needs to be redefined and re-expanded and explored, right? And so I think you're right to name that, like, when we talk about masculinity, we have to really look at patriarchy, which is like, you know, the system that says that certain qualities and traits that are deemed feminine are not um, valuable and worthy. We have to look at that system that, and how that interacts with racism to create this prison and like the psychological prison and emotional prison for so many black men and masculine folks that we get trapped in. And then, and then we're, um, we become like, um, we become trapped in that and also leads to some mental health distress, but it also sometimes creates this avenues for white racism to exploit and control us. Well, w one thing on that note that I found really interesting in, in reading some of your interviews is, you know, you talk about the need for for victims of trauma to avoid normalizing that behavior and like you just mentioned a lot of our behavior is learned and and people experience trauma through generations that they carry with them and don't even realize so i mean obviously it's a complicated process but are there some techniques that people can use to recognize when their behavior is stemming from trauma and then how not to normalize that behavior yeah so I think the piece that I would say, um, as opposed to practice, which we could go into practice, but it'd be a little bit more involved. I would say we start with questions, right? And I think that like questions often, some, some really questions that guide us, regardless of our racial background, actually these are really good questions. What did, I, what did I learn from my people who raised me about what it means to show up in a relationship in the world as a man or a masculine person? What was modeled? Not what they just came and told you, this is what a man is, but what was modeled to me? What parts of that do I want to honor and keep? And what parts do I want to show up in different? And what do I need to process and move through to be able to show up in differently? So I don't repeat that pattern of trauma, that pattern of harm. Think about, imagine, you know, take some time to ask yourself, like when you were little, what did it feel like when your 
father or your caregiver showed up in a certain kind of way because that was the way they showed up. And maybe that was harmful. Maybe that was hurtful for you. So if you don't want to repeat that pattern, you got to process that pain. And then you got to get skills and tools and strategies to figure out how do I do it differently? So, I, so that my son, my children, my, my, my partner can have a different experience. But we have to ask the questions. What did I learn? What was I, what was I, what was I taught? But not just my caregivers, but also the culture at large. And what is the impact of me doing these things? What is the impact on my girlfriend, on my wife, on my, you know, like what is the, uh, on my partner? What is the impact? And, and, and how do I do the work? Because every day we have to make a choice that like, hey, we have, we have a lot of crappy choices in front of us about how we could show up. But how do I make a choice to like, you know, what, I'm not going to live out that trauma, that continuation. And what skills do I need to do to help continue making that choice every single day? And those tools might be therapy. It might be yoga. It might be meditation. It might be like, you know, it might be Reiki. It could be a lot of different practices. Working out. It could be a lot of things. Reading. You know what I mean? Like all those pieces, a lot of our tools and workshops. But find out what your tools are that you need. It might be medication. Find your tools. Ask those questions. And say and, and really feel and really understand that you have the opportunity to reimagine what it means to be a masculine person, a man, uh, a human being, based on your terms, not the terms that have been fed to you by this culture. Mm -hmm. well, speaking of pain and trauma, you know, I've seen a lot of people, you know, just expressing how it's been, you know, difficult to sleep with, you know, everything 2020, you know. Uh, are there any techniques that are like medication or even uh, meditation that uh, things can do to, you know, put their sleep, yeah. people can do to put their sleep schedule on? Absolutely. So there are, a lot, so there are a couple of things I will offer for folks who are struggling right now with their sleep, right? So one thing that's really important is getting some, getting someone to agree with you and have some accountability with, like, so for example, say you're quarantined with someone, you both like really grand and like, hey, we're taking 30 minutes of no screen time, limiting your screen time because screen time is going to up the anxiety. There are a lot of things that are happening right now in our world we have no control over. That could be really difficult, right? Um, definitely meditation, right? I will definitely recommend folks to take, like if you can do a 15, 10 minute meditation before bed, it will offer sometimes a calm and alleviate yourself as well as yoga practice. There are definitely a lot of like, um, we actually have some resources on our website too, connect you to some yoga teachers to practice. There's also some, some great things you can drink, right? Like, so like we do, I, I tell people like rose tea is really good. Chamomile tea is really good for easing anxiety. Like those pieces, even writing and journaling. We do a lot of writing workshops. We have a writing workshop coming up next Monday. It is actually for black folks alleviating, alleviating stress and anxiety. It's just like help, helping you write it out. Because a lot of times what's keeping us up is the unprocessed, undiscussed things, right? And understandably, like some of it we can't mitigate because it's just bigger than us right now. So we have to navigate that, but like finding some, some tools that help you cope better or help you cope with it and help you get your care as much as you can. And so those are some things I would suggest just off beta. We also have a anxiety workshop on our website. I invite people to check out by Dr. Dion Bates, who talks about a lot of anxiety management strategies that can help us too as well. I, I think, uh, um, you know, it might be helpful because you're, you're telling people, you know, all of these tools. Um, but are there some things within those, whether it is meditation or, or writing or journaling, like, you know, for someone who's just starting out, hasn't meditated um, and doesn't really understand the concept, like whether it's closing their eyes, what do I think about? Where do my thoughts go? How do I stop thinking? Uh, if you could give like just a beginner's <laughs> tip, right, to someone starting yeah. out on journaling or meditating, what would you say to them? So I appreciate you asking this question. It's a great question. Um, I'm a yoga teacher, and so I get this all the time. So I'm going to talk about yoga, then I'm going to talk about just any practice, right? So the piece with, with meditation I always tell people is it's about practicing presence, right? It's about practicing creating a little bit of centeredness, a little bit of peace within ourselves. It takes time. None of us are jumping into the first meditation and being like, I don't achieve world peace in Nevada. I'm good, homie. We good. Like, that's not how it works. Most people are on the faking it for the ground. They're taking pictures on mountains. You ain't feeling no inner peace. Like, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't work like that. What the practice of meditation really is inviting us to do is to take some, take some presence with our breath and get out of our heads and into our bodies, right? And just take a moment where we're not, we're just trying to practice creating a little bit of open. Now, in the beginning of doing yoga, um, I'm sorry, meditation, you, you might still be like distracted. You might still, be, that's okay. That's actually, that's really great if you're paying attention to the fact that you're distracted, right? Because what will happen is that as you do it more and more, you practice five minutes a day, you, you start off small, 
five minutes a day, you'll find that you'll, wait, I, I was actually completely calm for like a whole minute there. Yesterday it was two minutes. It was three minutes, right? Maybe it was 30 seconds. You, you'll find it'll grow. Start small. Don't be trying to do no hour. I tell people, but people like, yo, I try to meditate for an hour. I'm like, bro, what are you trying to do? Like nobody, you're, you're not going to start off there. It's, it's wild, right? Start off with like five minutes. Start off with 10 minutes. Re 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 realize that the purpose of meditation is to bring you in presence with yourself. And if you're being as present as you can in the moment, if you're connecting to your breath, you're doing it. That, just because you're distracted, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're not doing it right, because there's no right way to do it. It just means that you're still trying to figure out how to create more peace within yourself. So go slow, start small, you know, like find your resources, um, but don't feel like you've got to conquer it all the first time you start, you know? And that's with any practice, right? Yoga, Reiki, journaling, start small. Like, you know, a lot of times you come in like, I'm going to be the Reiki master. It's like, okay, bro, like that's not, like, you know, it's not how we go. We can't start off there. We got to start small. And so that's what I would say for folks is, um, and understand that what works for you may not work for someone else. Like I have a friend, she loves to color. She colors and coloring books and she just does that and that really helps her relax. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's, it's really easy for her. She'll like, she'll, she'll, well, I'm in California, so she'll smoke some weed, color, and she's good, right? Like, so we have a, like, you know what I mean? And for some people that might not work, people might be like, I need to go for a jog. I need to meditate. I need to do whatever. Practice, practice and figure out what works for you and it'll be trial and error. You know what I mean? But just find that. Yeah, that's good. People will, will find that useful. Absolutely. What's your what's your opinion on medication? You know, a lot of uh, medication that is used to treat anxiety and um, you know, other issues and the like <clears throat> is also has also been abused. You know, now uh, you know you you hear a lot of hip hop songs, but it's also um, you know re recreational drugs these days. You know, so. I know the intent for these, you know, uh, drugs was to combat mental health, but it seems like they're doing the complete opposite and causing it. What do you yeah. what's your opinion on that? Any tool or any coping strategy can be harmful based off our relationship to it, right? So people might be like, oh, working out is good. Well, I've had some folks I've worked with who work out and it's, and it's actually not good because they're hurting themselves. So they're doing it so much, trying to run away from their pain that they navigate their anxiety. They're working out six hours a day. It's like your body can't actually tolerate that. Any tool, any coping strategy can be harmful. Medication is not exempt from that. Medication is one tool that some of us need to navigate our mental health. And there's a couple of pieces that I want to add to that. So we need, the, some people need that tool to help them navigate their mental health. Medication has side effects and impact, right? When it has those side effects and impact on our bodies, it's important for us, particularly as Black folks, to advocate for ourselves and let our psychiatrists and our clinicians know that like, this impact is happening and I need support around the impact. Because a lot of times when those things are happening, we're just not saying anything. Because like, and, it, and, it, and it's related to maybe the dosing is too high. Maybe the combination is inaccurate. But we're just going around, I'm not gonna take them anymore. I'm not gonna take them anymore. It's like, well, wait, wait, before you start, get off of them and you create chaos, you need to figure out, is the psychiatrist, and you let them know what's happening with your body. Maybe the psychiatrist isn't the best psychiatrist for you. I always tell people that a psychiatrist and a therapist, those, they're just like a barber. I might go to a barber, they can cut my hair, they got me lined up looking real good. You go to that same barber, you be like, man, you done messed up my beard. What you got me looking crazy at you? Like, you got, every barber isn't for everybody, right? So you have to find the right therapist and psychiatrist who works for you. Just because they got that person fade looking good don't mean they're going to fade you up right, right? You know what I mean? Right. So it's important, that piece of medication. But any tool can be abused. And medication can be abused. Working out can be abused. It's about our relationship to it. And how do we have a relationship with these things that helps us still be in dignity and honor and respect? A lot of us are coping and trying to numb pain through medication, through drugs, through sex, a lot of different things, right? And, and like, so it's really about, it's not about the sex or the drugs or the alcohol. It's really about me numbing and what I'm trying to run away from. And so if I start confronting my stuff, if I get the emotional courage, the emotional guts to just face what's going on within me, which is a long, hard process. I'm not trying to make that easy. It's a very difficult and arduous process. But if I cultivate that within myself, then my relationship with those things change. Because I'm not used, I'm not dependent upon that to, to, um, to numb or to, to run away from, you know? And some people might be needing medication all their lives, but their relationship with it maybe will change as they practice um, 
uh, with a with a therapist or a psychiatrist that helps them navigate it in a more um, more round and whole way. If that makes sense. One thing, one thing that you mentioned earlier that I think um, people could find value from the conversation is about feeling anger, um, especially right now when I've seen a lot of people just say they feel angry, um, very understandably so. Um, but I think a lot of people don't know how to necessarily properly deal with that anger. So, you know, from your perspective, um, how do you think the best way for people to deal with that anger is? Should we be feeling it fully? Should we be embracing it? Should we be trying to calm ourselves down? Like, you know, especially uh, people who are out there, let's say protesting and, and getting involved every day. How, how's the best way to deal with anger? Yeah, no, great question. So I definitely don't, I think there's many ways to deal with anger. I don't think it's a best or wrong or right way, but there's many ways to navigate anger. A couple of pieces I want to like preface this piece with, right? So anger, like all of our feelings, um, is never the problem. I can be angry all day. My feeling isn't the problem. My behavior in relationship to that feeling is what could be the challenge, right? I could be mad at you all day. We could be mad and this is what I'm just mad. But if I start coming over there, jumping on you and hitting you, the behavior is a problem, not the feeling. So we need to realize that we never want to control our feelings. We want to manage our behaviors in relationship to our feelings, right? Be able to process and be present with that, right? So that's the first piece I would say. Um, there are many ways for us to channel our anger. A lot of people channel the anger and they get out and, they do, and they, they're organizing, they're donating, they're having these conversations, they're talking to their friends and their family about these pieces, right? Definitely powerful way. Find a way to channel your anger in a way that is productive and useful and helpful for you and your community. And only you know that. Some people get in, some of my people might get in the studio and they just bang it out. Be, that's, that's how you process it, right? That's powerful. That's beautiful. Poetry. It could be going to the gym. Find that channel for yourself. Anger is also, I think one of the pieces important to say, anger is often what I call an umbrella emotion. When I call it an umbrella emotion, it means that anger is often what particularly masculine people and men often run to. We go to anger, but underneath that umbrella is where we'll often find a deeper transformation, and that's where the hurt and the sad and the scared is. You know, anger is easy because we're like, yeah, I'm mad, I'm mad. But the, but, the, the, but the pain is a little bit harder for us to go underneath there. And sometimes sitting with that, processing and moving through that and owning that, like, I am not only angry and furious at the violence that's happening against Black people, but I'm also devastated and hurt and scared for my son for my cousins, for myself, you know, that those things are real. And then like, you know, like, and, then, and, if, and many white people who are in this moment saying, I'm not only frustrated and angry at what's happening to black folks, but I'm also frustrated at my white friends who are dismissing this, at, my, at the, the racism that I know I've experienced through my white friends, the things that I've seen, you know, and the, and the fact that the system is even built in a way that denigrates black friend, my black friends. So honor, honoring what's underneath that is really powerful. But finding your channel and using your channel, like you all are doing on a, like this medium, this is a channel for that. Finding your channel, working through it. You might need multiple channels, right? Like I know for me, I gotta work out every day because if I don't work out, I'm gonna be like, I'm stressed. Like, you know, <laughs> working out for me is important. Meditation for me is important. Having a therapist I talk to two times a month is important. But that might not be your plan. That might be not your map. You gotta find your map. Yeah, that's true. I guess my last question uh, to piggyback off that, uh, ironically, would be, you know, we're in an era where, you know, reform and reconstruction is, you know, all the rage. You know, everybody's talking about, you know, how can we just make this earth better? So in your opinion, you know, how can we get to a point where mental health is a part of our daily regimen? You know, yeah. how it is like history class or recess? Yeah. yeah. What well, the... I think we have to like begin to transform the way we think of the world. We need to think about what does it mean for to have healing centered schools, healing centered education, like what would that world look like, you know? And it goes back to the piece you said about um, like, you know, in terms of like the way our system is set up right now, like in the way our schools are set up, like how do we shift those to center mental health and wellness so that like, I don't become a 50 year old man who just the first time being like, oh, now I'm finna deal with my feelings. Like we don't, we wanna change that. We have to do massive education. We have to create art. And like, you know, we have to have the space to be like beam holes. Like, you know, we support ourselves. We also support a lot of other organizations who do the work too, because we know it can't end with us, right? And so I think that that's a part of it. Transforming it means some of the, some of the concrete things are like, one, we, we need universal health care, you know? We need, we need people to have access to really, to health care, wherever they are, however much money they make, 
so that they can get a therapist if they need a therapist and it's not gonna cost them $5,000 but they can't afford, right? We need, we need to think about those pieces. We need to think about um, fully funding education. So that like schools are these places, just imagine what, was, what would happen if schools in the hood, I think about, because I go to, we're not seen as these kind of like scary places you go to, but actually seen as like these learning centers that were powerful and you had all these resources. If we took more money out of the police force, which is hurting us, and put that money into education, which will give us more channels for, us, for our creativity and brilliance. We're all children, right? Black, Latino, white folks, right? We can do this. And so we got to imagine differently because the system has tricked us into believing, oh, this is the only thing that's possible. No, it's not. It's the only thing that you want us to believe is possible because it serves your interest. But we know another world is possible for all of us, for healthcare, for cheaper and a more affordable therapy, for better medications, not just even just medications, better medications than what we have now. All that's possible. But um, we got to fight for it and we got to let them know that we won't back down. You talk on the website about um, this uh, Black woman superhero syndrome where you know, they're forced to take on the world uh, as this strong, you know, woman who nothing gets through. But at the end of the day, that stereotype in general is harmful to a lot of people. Um, you know, what are some strategies that we as a community, as men, can even take to, to help lift that burden and, and how you guys are dealing with um, that during this time, especially when they're a lot of times the ones out in the front lines fighting? Great question. I appreciate you asking the question. For Black men, for men in general, the work, a big part of the work is we have, to, we have to start doing our emotional work so we can take the emotional labor off of women and Black women. We have to start holding Black men accountable and men accountable for sexism and transphobia and misogyny. We have to figure out a way, like, we have to understand that we can be, you can be masculine and male identified in the world in a way that doesn't denigrate the existence of women or rely on the exploitation uh, of, of women, right? Particularly Black women who hold that burden. So I think the piece of it is, how do we step up into like, one, showing up on the, on the, on the, on the, in the field, but also not um, denigrating black women, not, not, not supporting systems that denigrate black women, not support, supporting systems that denigrate black trans women, like, you know, like really like shifting the way we think. Cause we've been, we've been trained with a lot of sexism and misogyny, right? We've all learned it. We're not, no, I don't believe anybody's exempt from it. You know, we even catch ourselves saying things and be like, oh, well, why did I say, why did I assume the doctor was a he? I don't know, I just assumed it was a man. Like, you know what I mean? We have those things in us. And so I think the part of the work is beginning to do the self-examination, but also holding other men and masculine folks accountable. When you see your friend disrespecting his wife in a certain way, or you see him acting violently, not just being that I ain't in my business, I'm like, hey, bro, how can I help you? Because like, what's going on right now is not cool. I need to, how can I support you? I tell people all the time that like being a good friend isn't saying, isn't dismissing or denying harmful things that our male or masculine friends are doing. It, what it, being a good friend is saying, hey, I will support you and doing whatever you need to help you change your behavior so you can show up with honor and dignity. Word. That's how we show up. 